Все то такие же, как я, несчастные, замучены. И мне не на что больше надеяться. Но я могу, понимаете, я могу им помочь. Никто им помочь не может, а я гнида. Я гнида могу. Я честно подойду на том, что могу им помочь. В этом все. Ничего не хочу больше. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Let's Take Five, the podcast where we take a cinema legend and then take five of their films to highlight their excellence and range. My name is Austin Luger. My name is Eric Martindale. And we are on week two of our Andre Tarkovsky Five. Last week, we covered his film, Ivis Childhood. Coming up, we have Solaris, The Mirror, and Stalker. But today, we are diving into Andre Rublev, which is a lot more epic and grander than the, the small story of Ivan's Childhood. And luckily, we are joined by a guest to help us with that epic quality. Um, Ed Lear is a writer and filmmaker based at L.A., and also this guy with the junior high with, who I'm uh, reconnecting with on this podcast. Ed, how are you doing? Pretty good, Austin. Happy to be here. So, Ed, you told me that you are a a really big uh, Tarkovsky fan. Is Andre Rublev one of your favorites? Um, it is now. <laughs> I had actually never seen it. Ah. Uh, and I it took it upon you asked me of all the films you wanted I wanted to talk about and I kind of took it a challenge of like I need to see this movie. Um so yeah, that's um I've now seen it and it is one of my favorite. I think it's an, a masterpiece of his. Well, I it's it's hard to to summarize this this three hour film and what I'm about to do will make it seem smaller than it is, but it is the story of this real life um, artist Andrei Rublev, who is at first he is kind of um, he's an assistant, right? I mean he is uh, followed by other people who are more established in their craft, but as more drama kind of goes on in Russia, he is seen more and more as this great. Um, artist of, of Catholic imagery, but rewatching it, I'm not quite sure it is always the most positive depiction of Catholicism or sometimes <laughs> even art, uh, which is crazy when or you make humanity, it, or humanity <laughs> or you know balloons. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it's like basically the whole thing is this. This was a difficult movie for me to get into. I love Tarkovsky as well, but I don't think. Um, I don't think I've ever watched a movie in more sittings than this film. <laughs> I, I think, I, which is which is weird because it's it's broken up into eight acts, I believe, mm -hmm. or seven acts, something like that. And it took me that many sittings to to watch the film. Um, and you know, the thing is, it's 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 very very dense, but it's not it's not necessarily complicated. I kept thinking the whole time I was watching it that there was some sort of uh, greater meaning that I was I was missing in, in here. And what I would do is I'd watch a segment or I'd watch one of the acts and then I would I would go to the Wikipedia, then read the synopsis of the act because I thought <laughs> I thought that I had missed something. I was like, wait a minute, what did that mean? And then I'd read it and go, No, that's exactly what I saw. I, I, I just you know, when you get into movies like Solaris, which in a lot of ways is like what it means to love someone or stalker where you can uh, you can take a billion different things from that masterpiece mm -hmm. but in this this film here because of because there's kind of a man behind the curtain with Tarkovsky a little bit just in and what he's trying to show and what he's trying to illustrate I thought it was pretty straightforward here um I and I kept going I kept thinking there was more and then I started thinking wow this is a whole lot of Catholic guilt that I don't understand. Like, they, they, that's what I felt like was sort of going over my head a little bit. And I just don't have that. I don't have that in my life. Uh, cause I didn't, I didn't grow up a Catholic. I wasn't raised Catholic. wasn't around it that much. That um, yeah, a whole lot of, a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of Catholic guilt. I wasn't understanding. I, I also did not uh, grow up Catholic. I'm not very religious, but something that always interested in me when you hear, when I read about history and about, uh, Catholic's role in, in history is, especially early on, the strong level of elitism. And I think the other thing that Tarkovsky is going with here because, like, way back when, um, only the the elite kind of monks would be able to even know how to read. So only they're the ones who can read the Bible to the common man. And I kind of saw uh, Tarkovsky as commenting on a lot of the art in the same way because in that opening segment when you have a man who's actually lifted in the air by this balloon... Um, is only when he's super high up in the air, that's when you see these faces on this church. So no one on the ground can see them. This is perhaps art just for the sake of God. And it's it's not welcome to so many people. 
Uh, Ed, ha- ha- what's your relationship with uh, Catholicism and the way Tarkovsky is depicting this? Um, my relationship with Catholicism is fairly non-existent. Uh, I did go to a Catholic high school, though, but I was not raised Catholic at all. Um, it's interesting to me Tarkovsky's sort of viewpoint because he is such a I mean he's a lapsed Catholic I think um, as you can see in his other movies where he if not negates God shows some real antagonism for him Um, and this film felt so like you have Andre Ruba. How do you say his last name? I've been saying Rublev. I th- he's adding. Rub- I, I think Austin's adding an extra A in there. I think it's just. I think it's just Rublev, right? Andre Rubla. Rubla. Uh, I never got this right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Ed. Well, I thought what, it, what I thought was interesting was this. It, it's this biography of a painter, and you never see him paint a stroke. I think throughout the whole movie. Um, because he's his whole time is spent sort of just observing these people and trying to come to terms with what uh, the Catholic Church says he should feel. You know, there's that scene where he has to film the or he has to paint the damnation scene, and he can't do it. You know, he's so. Um, has this internal struggle about like I don't I, I don't feel comfortable with that you know I don't it, it's this insane amount of empathy for these people around him and he sees all this suffering um, yeah he doesn't want to he doesn't want to scare people to religion I think was like kind of the, the note yeah. that kind of got there and it's interesting that you say you said that he you didn't notice him you paint throughout the entire film because the first thing I said to Austin when he came over here to do this I go is is it weird we watched a movie about a painter and we never saw him paint yeah <laughs> I mean it's, it's three hours long we never saw him paint and um yeah I, I thought that that was I thought that that was uh pretty pretty wild <laughs> well, and it, it's so interesting that that relationship between what andre is doing what his his predecessors are doing because the the older man that he's with for a lot of the film uh let's see if i get this name wrong as well Kirill. 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 Yeah. Oh. i mean this guy is seems to hate most people and like <laughs> when you have uh this another scene early on when they come into town and there's this jester uh, jumping around, who I actually thought was really entertaining. Uh, typically, all gestures in film annoy me. The gesture from Ron, Ron. is the worst character ever. <laughs> yes. uh, but but this was like he was so good, and everyone in the barn is is loving it. It gets fun, except for Krill, and it's like this is the worst. And it is this look of like populism versus um, elitist attitudes of like what is proper. And when Krill is finally happy with art, when he meets um, Theo. Whatever his long name is, he yes he uh, he admires everything that that the the Greek has accomplished artistically, but the the main thing he keeps noting is the colors and how good the colors are, and yet Tarkovsky won't let you see that because this mm. this ninety eight percent of the film is in black and white, so they have the technology to show this to you, but much like the the Catholics are not allowing you to see the, the greatest art or the, the greatest scriptures. There's no satisfaction in it. It's yeah. just a very cold face. Well, I feel like the whole movie itself is maybe less about, it's why I think it's one of my favorite biopics that now that I think about it is because it's uh, most other biopics you have, like the setup of like the artist has a problem in his art. Which means he has also means he has a problem a parallel in his life, be it Johnny Cash or you know mm-hmm. Van Gogh, and so he has to go out and try to fix his life problems, and then uh, oh look, I fixed my art problem too. And you, I kept waiting for that moment where you know um, Andre was going to figure out something about his feelings towards God and humanity, and then he's going to pick up his brushstroke. And start, you know, going away, and that never happened. And 
I like realized how satisfying that is by the end because he doesn't it's not it's so much less about him and more about like look at this let's look at this world and see this man living in it and kind of what influenced him because I feel like Andre ultimately is just a watcher he just is a guy who's observing life he's not a very active protagonist in any way except mm-hmm. for the one guy he kills to uh, protect the, the mute woman um, which later. he which he regrets incredibly. Yeah. So, um, well, you know, I was thinking too that part of why he doesn't. I'm sorry, Ed, if you wanted to go on there. I, I didn't no. mean to hop in there. Um, it's difficult on Skype sometimes, but the it's like, it's that whole thing with like um, that. I was trying to I was trying to measure like why he why he is so inactive and so dormant, um, and you, we basically see him observing all the scenes. And the first thing I came to was. It, his ideas and his goals as a painter is to first observe the world before he can actually put it put it to paper and before he can actually start painting. And then another thing I started to get is that there seems to be some overwhelming responsibility of being the greatest painter because because it's not just a secular thing. It's a religious thing. So it's like God gave me this gift to be this unbelievable painter. Everyone in the movie acknowledges how incredible of a painter he is. And because the weight of that responsibility uh, to God means that he's too scared to paint. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and that's why I feel like we never see that in the film or we just see him watching for the whole film, but it's always sort of Andre balancing what he can give to the people as a mouthpiece for God and the responsibility that comes with that. And it's funny throughout the the second half, there's so much turmoil and chaos in the world that that's where I kind of saw him in more of a biopic element of like learning through his art, but it's never kind of stated because the the Greek and Krill never see, they seem to isolate themselves from the suffering of the people and all this chaos to have Andre be like amidst this horrible riot and him to question where is God during this horrible element and mm-hmm. especially when you have your attackers um, just openly kind of mock your faith as yeah. uh, the darkest joke in the movie of just the guy looking at like asking who's that lady the Virgin Mary who's that her kid Russia's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got a good chuckle out of that. Um, as, as there's horrible, horrible rape pillaging going on. And it, it's, it's the fact that Andre has seen this, it seems to me that's where I, I'm not a um, proper art critic. I, I, it's, I still struggle to know why the images at the end of him are extraordinary, but I think the film is just going to say that there is passion and truth from what he's seen, where it's posed, so many others have hidden themselves from the people who need this, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the Greek and Krill are just awful people with <laughs> world views that are horrible. I think one of my <laughs> one of my favorite scenes is when Krill agrees to be his assist, uh, the Greek's assistant, mm-hmm. and you're like he's like I will do anything you want if you come to my town and in front of Andre Rubla say you want me and you're like oh man this guy's <laughs> off and then the Greek sends his assistant and says Andre Rubla I want you. the Greek wants you and you're like oh whoa the Greek's a shithead too <laughs> they're all scumbags and they have this like these lofty world views that are so like you said removed from Humanity, and then you have Andre, who is so tapped in to the point of it. I mean, it, it kills him, really. I mean, he goes on that um, w- 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 silent. What's, what's what do you call it? The code of silence or vow of silence? Yeah, yeah vow, vow of silence. And I mean that the actor is just. I think he's on. He's in Stalker too. It's oh, just it's so good. It's, he's- his eyes say so much without oh, yeah. ever having to talk. He doesn't talk for like the second half of the movie. Mm-hmm. So why does he start talking again? What is it about the bell? Um, the bell well, that's forged. Just talk about how awesome it is that the movie just suddenly shifts to a little boy trying to build a bell. Yeah. <laughs> Was that the kid from <laughs> Ivan's childhood? Like grown up? 
I don't. I think yeah. Is you think it? it is? Yeah, I thought it, I thought it might have been. Just I, I know because obviously he he does reuse some actors because I see him pop up every now and then. And then this guy's from Stalker as as well. Mm-hmm. Well, there's uh, only ten Russian actors. Well, so. <laughs> I, I only know like two Russian directors. Yeah, it's not a big Russian. <laughs> not a big film market. So why is that? Why? What about the crafting of the bell? Because I know there was something, and this is probably why I shouldn't be co-hosting a film podcast, but I was trying to finally, I was trying to figure out what the significance of the crafting of the bell was to get him to speak again. Well, I think there, this whole movie is all about this sense of creation. I mean, from the, the opening with the balloon mm. guy, which has nothing to do with, on. I mean, you know, he's not, the, he's not even there watching or anything. It's, mm. um, and you have the um, the sort of like less intelligent people coming to try to stop the balloon, and you know that's sort of the representative of like the um, ignorance kind of trying to come in and pull you back down. And I feel like by the time we've gotten to the guy, the this little kid who totally lied and bluffed his way into saying, "Yeah, yeah, no, my dad taught me how to make bells before he died." And he takes on this giant task that's way beyond himself and all the hardships and him kind of becoming a, a bad person in himself, too. Like, make he, you know, orders a, his friend to be whipped because he won't work. And he's just almost, like, crying. He's sobbing by the end. But it's such... It kind of feels like Andre Tarkovsky was talking about what filmmaking is like too, in the sense of like, yeah, you got to be ruthless, man, like to get this beautiful art made. You know what? So this is. I, I was taking a lot of times. I'll go out. I feel like I'm going out of limb, taking shots in the dark. I was surprised that the bell rang because yeah. to me, yeah, because to me. A, a lot of and it's not just with this story, but a lot of stories where the characters are are very religious and but they're having some sort of crisis of faith or something going on. It's always very this palpable feeling of the silence of God. And when the bell rang, I almost felt like that was the first time Andre heard God's voice, mm-hmm. and it was the actual bell ringing because we have. It almost feels like, in a way, kind of some sort of divine intervention. The kid does not know how to build a bell. He he does build this bell. But if the bell does not ring, the boy dies. And everyone who worked on the bell presumably does as well. well it also fits into this thing that I, I'm going to probably beat to death, this um, elitist versus populism, because I wanted to see how Tarkovsky is into this. A bell is for the people. It could still be mm-hmm. a majestic craft of geometry. Um, and art, but it is something that can be heard by the people as opposed to being locked into a church, though it can be seen by the elite. Um, and which is why it's so curious to see how this film itself, we, we opened this podcast saying that this is a denser film. Mm-hmm. Is Tarkovsky now being too elitist as he is challenging elitism? Because Ivan's Childhood, um, another really good film, I like this one more, but Ivan's Childhood could be watched by anybody. And, and, and get it. You can get the, the beauty and the story really well. This is harder to follow for the, the average person. I, now, now I sound elitist. God, this is the worst. You're talking <laughs> about Andre Rublev. It's impossible uh, to not sound pretentious. I know. <laughs> well, I would say though that this is still one of his lesser elitist films. I mean, I saw Stalker recently, a couple months ago, and I mean, that is... It's that Stalker is my favorite of his movies. But mine too. Mine too. It is so dense, and you. Have, I mean, I have to pause the subtitles to just read the text, you know. Mm-hmm. And this one, I kind of, at least understood the, the the problems they were having. I was like, okay, I understand what his problem is at least with Stalker and Solaris. It becomes he definitely gets more into abstract territory. And this one, I was like, oh wow, this is. It's dense, but it certainly was in the realm of, like, people's problems. Of, like, oh, this is – they're raiding and murdering people, and you know, the people are saying, what are you doing? You know, you're my fellow Russian. And it's, like – it's very – it grasp – I can grasp these issues that they're going Yeah, through. it's it's like the difference to me versus, like, Stalker 
and Solaris, which is, you know, what does it mean? You know, Solaris, mm-hmm. what does it mean to love somebody? Do you love the memory? Do you love, you know, we'll get into that when we talk about that. But And then in Stalker, it's, it's a spouting of philosophies from three very different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And in this movie, it's more like just asking a very broad question of why. And that's just what I kept doing. I would, I would see, like I said, I saw each segment, and then I was asking, okay, why do, why do I feel like I don't understand what just happened when it is so straightforward? <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, um, why is this so? Why is this moment so important to Andre Rublev's life? Like, what about that? Why did we watch this scene in particular? And that's what I was struggling with. The most, because I, I was trying to feel like, are we are we wondering what influenced Andre Rublev to be a great painter? Or are we wondering what influenced his his god or his religion? And like, why did I see what I just saw? And I don't really have good answers for that. Like I have for like, what does it mean to love someone in Solaris? So even though the, I agree with you, Ed, those those themes are a lot more abstract than this. It's just in this one, I just I was like. What, why, so would why? you say that Tarkovsky succeeded in being like Andre? Or is he more like his, his predecessors in this? Oh, Jesus. Uh, wow. <laughs> why? <laughs> um, that's a good question. That's a really good I question. honestly, watching this, it reminded me a lot of Grisson's Ahazar Balthazar. Oh, yeah. It's sort of silent. He, you know, he just endures. And he endures and keeps going you know trudging away at life and there's something sort of beautiful to that and um yeah i that's a good question austin i don't know it's i i'd like to like this is my third time watching it i saw it kind of back in high school was overwhelmed watched it for the immortals still pretty overwhelmed for some reason it clicked for me yesterday while you were throwing up yeah i was not <laughs> i was not well <laughs> <laughs> but I watched it in one sitting, and I had no other energy but look right at Filmstruck and watch this movie. Um, <laughs> and it all clicked. So I, I recommend that everyone get sick and watch this movie. Yeah. <laughs> but there's there's something so fascinating because, I mean, Ivan Tolley, which we reviewed last week, beautiful film, wonderful story. But oftentimes we, we comment on how those those war elements almost felt like a, a graveyard already. There's only a few people on screen. And now we have Tarkovsky. Now we have Tarkovsky jumping to insanely grand scale. I mean, these riot scenes um, reminded me of some of the greatest moments of like Kurosawa. Of like, you know, I thought Liquidation of the Ghetto from Schindler's List. Oh, really? Yeah. I, it, that just popped in there to me. Probably because yeah, totally there was some more, religious sure. persecution, kind of, mm-hmm. and even though it was really caught up in a, a struggle between two brothers, but. That's that. That's what I thought it was. Which, as far as raids are concerned, that's the best one I've ever seen filmed. This was pretty wild. I mean, yeah, because it, it just feels like there's, I guess, much like Shinra says, there's just no hope in it. Like yeah. there, there's, it's not a successful uprising or anything. Like that. It is just loss just and damage yeah. and pain. Butchering, yeah, it's a massacre. And 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 that, and that so much of it happens in a church too. It's, like just seeing them all just sitting there terrified in that church and the doors burst open you're like oh okay all these people are dead that shot was incredible where it Mm -hmm. shows Rublev standing there looking kind of at the film but a camera to the side and you're just hearing the pound 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 on the door and the break open and then the terror everyone has inside Mm -hmm. um i think that's important because that is a moment where he's trying to keep people um sort of He's trying to comfort these people, and there's literally no hope. And I think that might kind of sum up Andre Rublev's character. Well, and the in the film, perhaps, and I keep going to this gesture scene because again, I was so shocked. I enjoyed a gesture scene in a movie. <laughs> but uh, you have this guy; he's jumping on board. His, his song is very catchy and fun. Um, you have Krill, tis tisking the whole thing, but. Um, Tarkovsky was so amazing because after it's kind of over and after now the jester is kind of eating the bread and taking his breath everyone else in the tavern now is just so somber like they only were able to have release from it during the jester's performance their lives are just so upsetting <laughs> they, 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 there was not a smile in that room 
Uh, and it wasn't because Krill was being a dick. It was just because <laughs> <laughs> this is Russia in the 1400s. And I think Krill's line is, God gave us monks and the devil gave us jesters. Yes. <laughs> which is such, like, it's such bullshit because that, that momentary um, entertainment is so much better than anything Kirill could ever have given them. And there's like uh, a, a drunk guy in the tavern who tries to like replicate the jester's song. Oh, and he bombs. It, he bombs, and everyone like, and the jester kind of looks, was going like, "Kid, come on!" Like, <laughs> like the jester knows that he's actually really good at his craft. The mm-hmm. the tune, the song, and every time he flipped upwards in a handstand was well done. Yeah, as opposed to the jester from Ron. Um, the Jester from Ron's the worst character in film history. What? Ron, a oh, curse. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> it is a, an incredible... What about Danny Kaye? What's your opinion of that Jester? I don't like that movie, and everyone I know <laughs> loves the court Jester. I adore Danny Kaye and Singing in the Rain, uh, which is a Jester-like performance, but I also don't like stories about hypnotism, and that's all the court Jester, so it's just kind uh, of silly. Are you a fan? Um, no, not really. But yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to. It was the only other jester movie. I think. I'm going to think of some more jesters. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, one thing. I, what I think I wanted to add, just outside of it, was there is the the pagan scene, real fast. I want oh. to talk about that very briefly. I thought I found some sort of. Um, there was an odd sort of uh, beauty in that scene, quite a bit. So you got like these, you got these nude nudist pagans running around. It's like. Orgy night. I, mm-hmm. I'm just, they have a name for it, but I, I can't. I, I don't know what it is. Friday. Friday. And um, <laughs> so Andre Rublev watches them like a curious child, observing outward, looking in at that type of mm-hmm. of religion or display of the the absence of. Uh, in some mm-hmm. cases, I'm sure to him it would be. Um, and I, I know pagans have their own gods and whatnot, but so he's watching. He's watching a couple having sex mm-hmm. and he observes it like it, and then then when he gets caught he calls them all like so, you know they're all crazy they're bad people or whatever yeah. Yeah. and they start and they tie him up kind of you know like he's crucified and then then another pagan comes and releases him um that was kind of the only time where we saw him sort of be secular i felt like because he's oh, sure. he's observing them maybe like uh you know, uh, uh, someone observes like a, 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 a scientific project or something. They're watching, like watching but I fungus did, grow. I, but I did, but also yeah. because he's checking out people having sex, right? Yeah, no, I took from the performance that like this is much like has Al in the riots. He observed uh, chaos, hatred, and destruction. This is when he also saw uh, passion um, and, and sexual passion. Also, they're yeah. a lot happier. Than most people we see in this film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> still they all get until the next day. It's, it's yeah. kind of the nature of Catholicism, right? It's not the most cheerful religion. No, if it feels good, <laughs> you, yeah. you're going to die for it. Yes. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. Yeah. I just thought that like we, I'd be remiss not to bring that up. And the word I couldn't say earlier was experiment. It's like mm-hmm. observing an experiment. But he, it's just I thought that that was really interesting because it was like the only time I saw a secular version of Andre, where he's like. Yeah, this is really interesting. Human beings doing this. I'm actually going to watch it. Um, it reminded me of like the long history of uh, cinema directors sort of portraying voyeurs. But like, you got Hitchcock, you got mm. David Lynch with Blue Velvet, mm. and Brian De Palma. And I feel like this is Tarkovsky being like, "Yeah, I I really enjoy just watching." And if like he kind of, I think that's where he connects the most with this character Rublev like I'm sort of the detached voyeur and and yeah it is sort of secular but I think the whole movie he he he's, has a very much uh, personalized relationship with God in the first place that I'm not even sure I think he knows That's all of the yeah the um, the rules and you know like you said when he gets tied up then he starts quoting you know he falls back on his education mm-hmm but it's very much. Um, I, I got my own thing going on here. Yeah, you know, it's just funny because it's the only time, especially when he's tied up, that you see him that way. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like a, you know, like, like yeah. oh, I'm going to start quoting the Bible at you. You know, you, you're you're all going to hell, yada, 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 yada. And he's doing it when he's, you know, begging for his life, potentially. But he's in dire straits a lot later in the film, and he never, he never goes there. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, his relationship with God has probably changed quite a bit by that point. But I just thought that that was... That that scene in particular was unlike so much of the movie to me. At least, even if even if Andre's not that different there, it, it, it still it still seemed a little different. Yeah, well, right how, be, oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. I was gonna say that moment when the woman unties him and she kisses him. Just the look on his face is so like I. He looks more dejected there than I think throughout most of the rest of the movie. He just is like. So, like so ashamed. Well, I mean, I, I there's no way I can back this up properly. I'm definitely wrong. But like you were mentioned <laughs> in the beginning that we don't see Tarkovsky paint. I'm also now not seeing him like touch a lot of people. You mean Andre Rublev? Yeah, Andre Rublev. We don't <laughs> we don't Rublev. see Tarkovsky paint in this. No, film. no, we I don't. And that. I think that's a good choice on his part. <laughs> um, but but no, Andre Rublev. I'm, nope, now we're going to say it right. Um, yeah, because like just all of these these Catholic. Figures just they're always standing alone it, it feels like and it's that's a moment of, of tenderness and connection that you just don't see throughout the film I think it's time to now wrap it up who has any uh, final thoughts on the film uh, well I would like to say I just remembered the one time he does do any sort of art- artistic painting is when he smears shit on the wall <laughs> oh yeah that is true I was watching I was like Ooh, he's doing a little Jackson Pollock. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. With a little bit of Howard Hughes. Yeah. It's real. I mean, it's the only time he does any sort of like expression um, in that way. That's so true. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and the woman comes up and smells it, and is like, it was weird. She just freaked out. She was like, the, Why yeah. Do that? Exactly. You, like I was saying, why earlier? That was when I was screaming it. <laughs> why? Why? What is this about? Um, well, it smelled bad. Yeah. No. I. Yeah. I. I. I uh, you know. I, I. I enjoyed this film quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. I. I think that it's. Um, I, it's a good. It's a good movie. I, I want to say it's like the lesser Tarkovsky movies, but he made like seven movies, so it's like that's hard to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, and there, there's always they're so rich all of these films mm-hmm. um, that I feel like I kind of left it all in the field here. I don't have much more to go on. It's just, it's a, it's a great movie. I think everyone should see this movie. Um, I, I, was, I was so impressed this time through. I still kind of got more notes that I have like connected between like context of the Bible. Cause I felt like the whole story of like Jesus getting the money lenders out of the temple is so similar to all of this elitism of the Russian art uh, mm-hmm. within the, the temple. Uh, it's it's so interesting whether or not these characters are abiding by their own god or Tarkovsky's view of art and people. It just uh, it's a lot of uh, unhappiness. So you should watch it for three hours. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say I uh, just it's this it's the moment where I think Tarkovsky really comes into his own too because you watch uh, Ivan's childhood. And he's not there yet. I think I think it's a good movie, but it is very similar to other sort of Russian movies at the time. And just like the gap between that and this is astounding. That, like you said, the orgy scene is insanely beautiful. I, I watched that again, and I was like, "How did he pull this off?" Just like you really have to be under a, a state-operated film industry to get this to like be able to pull off. <laughs> funds back then no it's uh, it's it's true that's i, I mean in as austin said earlier they're talking about kurosawa the things that you're able to do in the background with extras and make it look so beautiful and uniform is is incredibly impressive in without story. anyone like hitting a mark in the same way yeah um yeah that's true um also like you s- start to see i mean it, there's a little bit of like his fascination with water in ivan's childhood but this one he really starts filming it in that very Tarkovsky way, and the use of animals too. Um, the, those horses, like my God, 
And oh, he I know. murdered a horse. Oh, he doesn't give oh. a shit about animals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I definitely Just saw it. Chip loves them so. I mean, yeah. it's like the representation of life and beauty, but he also shot one for the filming. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a poor little chicken got in the way of a horse and got trampled, too. That poor mm, guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I want to just uh, ask you, Ed, one quick question, kind of about uh, your career, because I just I was just thinking now about directors doing these kind of large shots up to extras. You worked on a Terrence Malick film. Uh, yeah, two actually. So, you, what you did, Knight of Cups, and did you do the the new one? Yeah, I was on Song to Song for uh, not the whole shoot, but I was out there in Austin um, helping for a little bit. Um, I, I've not seen Song to Song yet, but I have seen Night of Cups, and that's a movie especially with all those um, L.A. party scenes that have yeah. a lot of really famous extras. Um, were, <laughs> were, were you there for some of, of this, and how how does like Malik work with this many extras? Um, he does not make anyone hit the marks. I'll say that. Like, <laughs> it's a lot more... He literally throws a party. I mean, there's these... The club scenes in Night of Cups where uh, my job purely was to try to keep people – I mean you, it was filmed at a live club and he just had Christian Bale walking around. And my job was to keep sort of people from taking pictures or if I couldn't do that, then I had like a little light wand that I was supposed to uh, wave in front of if I saw cameras come out. Just to try to keep the verisimilitude okay. thick there. Um, yeah, it's it, it was, his is not one of like precision. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't carefully construct the frame. It's much more of like, okay, now we're going to go over here. Now we're going to go over here. It's a lot more kind of free flowing in the moment. But it, it still accomplishes that same kind of beauty. Um, it's like I, I never would imagine that. Like for some reason that. The major like party scene in Night of Cups sticks with me. It's like we're like he's talking to Dan Harmon now. Um, <laughs> that, that's still a really beautiful sequence, and it's just like a smoothy networking kind of party. Yeah. Uh, oh, a, oh, the mansion. Yeah. In yeah. The day. Yeah, with uh, Thomas Lennon. I heard Thomas Lennon's story about how Malik would just keep giving him note cards of like backstory of his character, mm -hmm. and then, like never acknowledge them again. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have to hand him the note cards? No, but I knew the girl who typed them up. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have a thousand more uh, questions about Malik, but I think we'll have to wait till we do a Malik 5. Um, oh, excellent. Because that'll be a ton of fun. But cool. uh, until then, everyone can go to theartmore.com, leave us your thoughts on Andre Rublev. Rub Rublev. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> See in the episode, I gotta learn this. Um, while you're there, you can check out the other podcasts, including The Immortals, which uh, yesterday just had a really uh, jam packed episode where we reviewed Network, Michael Jackson's Bad, Night Down Loof Balloons, Bridge of Terabithia, and Band of Brothers. So, damn. That didn't suck. <laughs> um, that was a fun one. And also, Ad Absurdum is back. Uh, their Westworld episode dropped uh, last week. This is where uh, two real lawyers. Uh, review something fictional and talk about the real life law implications of it and uh, this one is particularly cool especially when they talk about stories like how this real life case where a monkey took a selfie and no one could figure out who owns the copyright to that photo uh, Whoa. yeah I know <laughs> that, that's what someone argued <laughs> uh, I'll let you listen to the episode to see how that case went out but uh, check that out also be back next week with our review of Solaris I'm very much looking forward to that um, until then, Ed, where can we find you online? Uh, I'm on the Twitter and the Instagram. What's your handle? Uh, it is – well, my Instagram is Eyes Wide Shut Up. And <laughs> my Twitter is Edward M. Lear. Fantastic. Ed, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll see you all next week. I'm Austin Luger. I'm Eric Martindale. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.